Today, the title of my sermon is Focus on Christ. Focused on Christ. Last week, we talked about what Pastor DeGroot used to call stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Talked about focusing on the good, having a good attitude, controlling our thoughts. When it goes negative, we stay negative. When it goes positive, we stay positive. So today we're going to talk about focusing on Christ. <clears throat> Your eyes are pretty important. Your eyes are pretty important. Many of you might know this, many of you might not, but I'm legally blind in my right eye. Uh, I started fighting with sticks when I was a kid, got hit in the eye and had a traumatic cataract. They had to take the lens out of my eye and for probably 20-something years, I had no lens in that eye. I was legally blind. You want to talk about protecting that eye. I'm talking about my good eye, protecting my good eye. Every sport I did, everything I did, uh, I had to wear a visor. I had to wear safety glasses. I was Horace Grant before Horace Grant was cool. But I'll tell you what, my left eye, whoo, it's worth a lot to me. Somebody asked me, um, you know, I'll give you a million dollars if I can take your pinky and cut it off. Huh, I have it. I'll take a million bucks. Got nine more. I'm good with that. But if somebody said, I'll give you a million bucks to take your left eye, I'd say, no way. Mm-mm. Too valuable. I'll give you two million. Nope. I'll give you 50 million bucks for your left eye. Uh-uh. Not a chance. It's the only one I got left that works. So no one's taking it. It's priceless to me, my left eye. Priceless. This thing over here? Eh, whatever. But it's priceless to me. Your eyes are pretty important. Your eyes are pretty important. Where you look, where you focus is pretty important. What you keep your eyes on. I fought having glasses for about a year. I kept on making the font for my sermons <laughs> bigger and bigger and bigger so I could preach. Finally, when I got up to size 20 font, I said, Rhoda, you better go get your eyes checked. So I went into Sam's Club and I got a pair of glasses. The moment they did them all and fixed them all and they put them on my eyes and I walked out of there and I started walking around Sam's Club. Oh man, I could see like a werewolf. It was awesome. It was awesome. I could finally see clearly. I could focus. I could read my, I could read my phone without changing the font on my phone. It was awesome. Your eyes are pretty important. And where you look is pretty important. What you're, what you're focusing on with your eyes is pretty important. Because of all the things that tend to lose focus within us, our eyes often go first. It's funny how when you're not paying attention what can happen, when you're not looking where you should look. Remember, my dad worked at KCC. Now, when I say my dad, it's the one who raised me since I was about four and a half years old. My biological father, I've told you stories about him. That's not who I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about my dad who adopted me when I was four and a half years old. He worked at KCC, and the fun thing that we would do is he would let me bring one of my buddies, if there was a snow day or whatever it might be, one of my buddies was allowed to go up to the college, and my dad worked in the Miller Building, which was the athletic building, so we could play basketball, racquetball, lift, swim. We could do everything we wanted to all day. It was a blast. And the treat on the way home was to stop at Burger King. We'd stop at Burger King over there by Myers, over by uh, Lakeview. <clears throat> well, we had a Burger King where I lived over near the Galesburg area, right in the Comstock in front of that Myers, and we always went to that Burger King to eat, but it was a treat to come home or, or, or to come back from KCC and stop at the other Burger King. So we were there all day, and we stopped at Burger King on the way home. And so me and my buddy, uh, Mike, and my dad, and we're sitting there eating, and I look at the back, and the, the very, very back by uh, the bathrooms, now given, I'm like 14 years old, but even at 14, I had game. There's four good-looking girls sitting back there, high school girls, probably 17, 18 years old. I saw them sitting back there, and I said, Mike, I said, I'm going to go uh, walk by them, put out the vibe. <laughs> He's like, all right. So I got up, and I walked to the back. <clears throat> I walked to the back, and the bathrooms are right here, so I stare at them, give them a little nod. <laughs> Name's Matt. Hey, how you doing? 
and I walk into the bathroom. Now, did I have to use the bathroom? No. So I went in there, and uh, I fixed my hair in the mirror because I knew I was going to have to come back out, stay in there for a little bit. And I, and I came back out. As I come out, they're dying laughing, dying laughing. I'm like, what are they laughing at? I'm like, hey, and I just kind of walk by. They're di- like looking at me, dying laughing. As I'm walking to uh, Mike and my dad, they're both dying laughing. I'm trying to figure out what is going on. What's going on? Dying laughing. So I sit down. Those girls are still laughing. I said, what is so funny? And Mike said, dude, you just went into the women's restroom for five minutes. (laughs) I said, no, 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 that was the men's restroom. He said, no, look back there. And sure enough, I look back. Right by where those girls are sitting was was the women's restroom. I went in there for five minutes. What ends up the, the, uh, the Burger King and Comstock, the men's and women's restrooms were flipped. So where the girls was, the guys was. The one over in Battle Creek, where the guys was supposed to be, that's where the girls' restroom was. But guess what? I wasn't looking. My eyes were not where they should have been. They were looking at those four girls, and I looked like an idiot because I was looking at those four girls. Oh, your eyes will steer you in some places you don't want to go. If I only had stayed focused, I would have looked cool for a little bit. I look like an idiot instead. Today I want us to look at a story in Scripture when one of Jesus' disciples chose to focus on him. This is ultimately where our focus should be. However, as we are going to see in this story, Peter lost focus. Now everyone's heard this story. Everybody's heard this story. If you're a brand new believer, then maybe you haven't heard this story, but it's a pretty good story. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn there to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 33. 22 through 33 is where we're going to stay today. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look up on the screen. We have the scriptures up here. But I want to start out with reading uh, verses 22 through 25 of Matthew chapter 14. It says this, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already at a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Now, early in this passage, we see Jesus ask his disciples to get in the boat, and head across the lake. Now, he just got done uh, feeding 5,000 people. So what do the disciples do? They do what they're told. They get in the boat, and they start heading across the lake. Well, then the storm comes. Jesus prays, and then he heads out on the water. And I believe that when it comes to focusing completely on Christ, we can learn a lot from this piece of Scripture. Three things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you today, and I'm going to let you get out of here. Three things. Number one. What can stop us from focusing? Number one is fear. Fear. There's a lot of fear within the disciples because Jesus was nowhere to be found. They're in the boat and the storm starts up. And the wind and the waves and and it's tossing the boat around and the fear kicks in. Fear kicks in. They're afraid that they're going to drown. They're afraid the boat's going to sink. Can't blame them. When Jesus finally came back onto the scene, walking across the water, initially, instead of calming their fear, uh uh-uh, it increased their fear. It increased their fear. Matthew 14, verses 26 and 27 says this, When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were afraid. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Initially, when Jesus came on the scene, They were afraid. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Now, a significant reason as to why they were afraid was simply due to the fact that initially, Jesus wasn't there. He wasn't there. It was just them on the boat, and they were afraid. They looked around the boat when the storm hit, and they could not see Jesus, and they were afraid. However, even when he appeared walking on the water, they did not think it was him. They were still afraid. Have you ever been there? You ever been at that point? 
Have you been in a situation for a long time you were focused on Christ with no issues and no bumps in the road and everything was great and everything was smooth sailing and everything was awesome and then all of a sudden something happened. You got a phone call. You got a doctor's report. Something happened and all of a sudden you realized you were in the middle of the storm and it was so easy to focus on Christ and not be afraid until that phone call came. And all of a sudden, you started to take your focus off Christ because of what you were dealing with. I can admit, it's sometimes a lot more difficult to see Christ when we're in the middle of the storm. It really is. It's harder to see him sometimes. I remember years ago, I took uh, a bunch of kids down to Galveston, Texas, after that hurricane hit. Took uh, 14 college kids down there, and we worked for the week. Well, I was a big, big, uh, I want to drive all night to get home type guy. So I asked the kids, I said, hey, I said, why don't we leave at nine? I said, I'll drive the first shift. I said, and you guys can sleep, and we're going to make a straight trip from Galveston, Texas, all the way back to Michigan. They're like, sweet, we want to get home now. I said, all right. So we got in the van, headed out about 9 p.m., And we started going directly east, directly east on a highway. It was a big highway. We started heading that way, and then we were going to cut up. Well, we get about a half an hour on the road, and I had a couple of kids, Jerry Van Dorpe and um, uh, another kid, uh, John John Campbell. Actually, you probably saw him and his wife sing when uh, we were just doing virtual stuff. But they said, Pastor Matt, we promise you, we promise you we'll stay awake. We'll promise you we stay awake. Baloney! I got about an hour onto that drive, and we're going that way, and I look back, all of them are out cold. Whoa, gosh, they had a hard week. Wah, wah. Well, I had a hard week, too. So we're driving, and I kid you not, I got a big trailer. I got 14 kids packed into one van, and we're driving down this highway, and a storm hit... Unlike any storm I've ever driven through in my entire life. Now, driving through this storm in, 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 a, uh, in a normal car would have been tough, but I've got a giant trailer and a huge 15-passenger van. And I'm driving in this storm, and I kept thinking, well, it's got to be done soon, got to be done soon. I drove through that thing for three hours Cars are going in the ditch because of hydroplaning. For three hours, I am white knuckle. On that van like this, I could barely see the car ahead of me 50 50 yards or 100 yards because it was raining and blowing so bad. It was awful. And twice I said, Jerry, 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 wake up. Yeah, right. So for three hours I drove through that thing. And I can tell you what. Oh, there (laughs) there was a few times when I'd see a car shoot off into the ditch. Saw it twice. Car just shoot off into the ditch because there was so much uh, rain, rain on that road. I said, Lord, I said, I know, I know, I know you've been with us all week, but boy, you better be with me now. You better be with me now. And I'll tell you what, being, being in that storm, man, I was looking at the storm. I was looking at the weather and I wasn't, I wasn't always focused on knowing that God was watching over us as we were driving down that road. There was plenty of fear in me. Plenty of fear. Side note, never take five five-hour energy drinks in three hours. It gives you hallucinations. That's all I'm going to say about that. But boy, I was afraid driving. Fear, fear can look many different ways in the middle of a storm. It can look many different ways. For some of us, a storm causes us to focus on our past. When we're in the middle of a storm, we look at our past and we think, you know what? You know what? I'm blaming myself for this. I'm not going to focus on Christ. I'm in the middle of fear. I'm in the middle of the storm. I'm going to focus on my past. That's a dangerous thing to do. For others, a storm causes us to focus on our future, not knowing if we will even have one. How many, is of, how many of us have had that mindset before? You're in the middle of the storm. Fear has gripped you, and you're so worried about your future that you're wondering if you're even going to have one. 
For Peter and the rest of the disciples, the storm caused anxiety and fear in the present moment, not knowing how they would respond. I'm going to tell you right now, make up your mind how you're going to respond to fear. Make up your mind as a believer in Christ how you're going to respond to fear. The, the, the reason why I think the, the disciples were so afraid is because they weren't ready for that moment knowing that because of what they were going through, they were going to deal with fear. So they didn't know how they were going to handle it in that moment. As Christians, I'm telling you right now, if you're not in a storm, one's coming. If things are going smooth and things are great right now, then praise God for it. But a storm's coming. I don't know how it's going to come. I don't know when it's going to come. But everybody in here is going to be dealing with the storm. So get your mind right right now, knowing that when that fear hits, you're not going to panic, but you're going to keep your focus on Christ. You're going to keep your focus on Christ. I was talking to a pastor a couple days ago. And he said, Matt, how's things going at the church? I said, Pastor, I said, it's awesome. I said, I could not be happier right now. I said, the family's doing great. I said, Noelle's happy. She found a six foot ten boyfriend and he's a Christian and I know I'm going to be watching sports the rest of my life if they have kids. I'm excited about that. And Gage is, Gage, Gage is happy and things are going great for him. He's getting good grades. He found an awesome girl he's dating at the school. I said, things are going great. I said, the church is going great. I said, we get new people coming every week. People are giving their hearts to Christ. It's going awesome. He said, what about your leadership? I said, Pastor, I said, my elders and deacons are awesome. I said, they aren't just elders and deacons. I said, they're my friends. I said, we get together, we have elder meetings, and we laugh, and we get stuff done, and we back each other up, and it's just awesome. I said, things are going great. Things are going great. I couldn't be happier. He goes, Matt, I'm so happy for you. Buckle up. Something's coming. What? Why? Tell me that. Buckle up. Something's coming. There's going to come a time where Satan attacks his church in some way, shape, or form. A storm's coming. I don't know when. Maybe it's a year from now. Maybe it's five years from now. I don't know when, but a storm will come and it will hit this church. And guess what? We need to get our minds right that when it hits, we still focus on Christ. Still focus on Christ. Sometimes I feel as Christians, we kind of get lazy if things are going well. And we take our focus off Christ because things are going so great. Never take your focus off Christ. A storm's going to be coming sooner or later. And when it hits, don't fear it. Keep your focus on Christ. Much of the anxiety and fear caused in the storm was because they didn't know how they were going to respond. Know how you're going to respond when the storm comes. And don't start out with fear. Don't start out with fear. Robert Louis Stevenson tells the story of of a ship that was caught in a storm right off a coastline. And they sent out a call to all the passengers. Get below deck, get below deck, get below deck. The storm is strong and it's pushing us towards this rocky shoreline. So they're all down and they feel the boat being tossed back and forth. And uh, one of the passengers said, I got to go up top and I got to go to the... um, uh, uh, I got to go to the control room to see what's going on up there. So he makes his way up the stairs, he gets up on deck, and it about blows him off deck, and he makes his way, and he climbs these stairs to get to where the steering room is, and he uh, walks in there, and he expects to see chaos. And he, and, he, and he swings open the door, and there's a guy standing there at the steering wheel, and he's, and he's having to put force into it, but he's slowly, inch by inch by inch, he's steering the ship. And this guy, he opens up the door, he's covered in rain and he's panicked and he looked at the guy steering the ship and the guy just looked at him, nodded, smiled. And with that, he shut the door and he ran back across the deck and he went down the stairs and he went back to where everybody was at and they said, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? He said, all is well. The guy steering the ship smiled at me, all is well. You know Christ is steering the ship, right? He's got his hands on the wheel. And we're being tossed around and we might be in the bottom of the ship and we're thinking, oh man, oh man, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. I'm here to tell you right now, Christ is smiling. He's still steering the ship. All is well. All is well. 
Do not start out with fear. The second thing that will get you off track, take your focus off, off Christ, is distractions. Distractions. Peter and the disciples' situation, in the middle of it, their storm acted as a distraction and caused them to lose focus. Matthew 14, verses 29 through 30, says this. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Hmm. There are many different distractions that we face on a day-to-day basis. I'm going to tell you something right now, and I hope you download this. I hope you download this because this is a great statement, and I did not come up with it, but it's still a great statement. I'm here to tell you right now, if Satan can't destroy you, he will distract you. I'm going to say it again. If Satan can't destroy you, and he's always trying to destroy you, if he can't destroy you, he will distract you. He'll try to take your focus off Christ. Many of us look for the great big wrecking ball coming into our lives to ruin our faith. That Satan's going to do something big and just try to take us out and destroy us. Uh Uh-uh, Satan does little things to take your eyes and your focus off Christ. If he can't destroy you, he will distract you every single time. In Matthew chapter 4, the devil used this very tactic on Jesus. Go ahead and bring that up. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, I love this piece of scripture. It's when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Now, this is a whole sermon unto itself. But the first thing he tempts Jesus with is pride. The second thing he tempts Jesus with is power. And the third thing he tempts Jesus with in this scripture is possessions. His possessions. He puts Jesus on the uh, on this on this mountaintop. He says, "Look at all these. Look at all this stuff. Look at all this stuff. All of it." can be yours if you bow down before me. I want you to take your eyes off the prize and focus on everything around you, Jesus. Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, no way. Not doing it. Not doing it. Satan knew he was able to, was not able to destroy the Son of God, so he tried to distract him. I'll, I'll give it all to you if, if you only kneel down and worship me. I'm telling you right now, Satan wants to have you take your focus off Christ and focus on all these other things around you. Money and valuables and a house and a car and a job. He wants you to focus on all those things first and take your eyes off Christ. He wants you to be distracted. wants you to be distracted. Reminds me of a story of a guy that bought a $2,000 hunting dog. And this dog was trained to track down bear. This guy loved hunting bear. So he took the dog out. The dog had been trained. It's good to go. And he takes it out in the woods. And he says, all right, sick him. Go find me a bear. So this dog takes off. And this guy is running, is running, 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 running behind this dog. And pretty soon the dog stops. Gets the scent of a deer. Boom! Starts chasing after that deer scent. So this guy sees him tearing this way. So he starts chasing after the dog this way. And pretty soon, the dog stops. Boom! Gets the scent of a raccoon. Boom! Starts chasing the scent of that raccoon. Going, 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 going. And this guy is just out of breath. He's just completely exhausted. Pretty soon, that dog stops. Smells a rabbit. Takes after a rabbit. This guy starts chasing after his dog, chasing after his dog, chasing after his dog, and he sees the dog stop again, chase after something else. So now he's walking, he's dripping with sweat, he's exhausted, he's been chasing his stupid dog 45 minutes. He finally comes up on the dog, and the dog is at the hole of a field mouse. Digging, 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 trying to get at that field mouse. Tell you what, he spent a lot of money on a dog that was supposed to track bear and ended up Catching a field mouse. 
That's us as Christians, you realize that. How many times we have our focus on the big prize? We know, we know what we're supposed to go after, and we're after it just like that hound dog, 110%, flying after things of Christ, and pretty soon we stop. We get our scent on something else. We start going another direction. Then we get our scent on something else. We start going another direction. And then this direction, then that direction, then this direction. Then pretty soon, man, we had our eyes on the prize, but all of a sudden we're digging after a stinking field mouse as a Christian. I know what's happened to me, and I know what's happened to all of us, and it can happen just like that. You don't even know how you got where you're at and how distracted you were, but all of a sudden, you're so far away from where Christ wanted you, and you don't know how you got there. Be careful. If Satan can't destroy you, he will distract you every single time. For Peter, the distractions were the wind and the waves. Some of us here today are living like Peter. We're focusing on the wind and the waves crashing around us. What I think is so wild when I think about this story is that I've never been one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. I got to meet him in person. Now, obviously, I have the Holy Spirit in me, and that's awesome. But I've never got to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a physical Jesus. Peter is standing on the water looking at Jesus. Jesus is probably within arm's reach of him, and yet he still couldn't focus on Christ because of the wind and the waves. That says a lot. Sometimes Christ is with us whatever we're going through. He's right next to us. Guess what? If you gave your heart to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. God is with you 24-7, but yet sometimes when the wind and the waves hit, how come we can't stay focused on him? For some of us, the wind and the waves in our lives, it might be an unhealthy relationship. It might be a toxic relationship in your life, a toxic friendship. Girls, guys, make sure that who you're dating is not taking you off course from Christ. It might, it might be a website that people keep going to again and again and again, and you know you shouldn't be going to that website. There's filth on it, nasty stuff on it. A man is drawing your focus away from Christ. Drawing your focus away from Christ. Might not be a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing in your mind, but it's still drawing your focus off Christ. If Satan can't destroy you, he will distract you each and every time. And number three, the last one, doubt. Doubt. <clears throat> Fear, distractions, and number three, doubt. Matthew 14, 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Peter had faith initially when he stepped out of the boat and started walking on the water. Oh man, he had faith. He was filled with it. However, when he realized what he was actually doing, he started to doubt. Started to doubt. Holy cow. I know I'm a Christian. I know I have the Holy Spirit in me. But I don't know if I can do this. How many times have we said that? I don't know if, I don't know if God's going to get me through this. You start to doubt. And when he doubted, he started to sink. He was questioning whether or not Jesus could actually be his safety in the storm. Now I'm going to tell you right now, people in your life, there's a lot of people in your life who, 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 you better have doubt. You better have doubt. I promise. I guarantee. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> Baloney. You can doubt a lot of people saying stuff to you in your life. Never doubt Christ. You can doubt people. Reminds me of a story of a guy that went in for an uh, operation. And he's getting ready to be operated on, and the nurse said something. And all of a sudden, he stood up and he bolted out of the operating room. Starts running down the hallway. Starts running down this hallway, that hallway. And one of the hospital administrators is standing there, sees this guy running down the hallway in a gown with his buns hanging out. He says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? 
He goes, there's no way. There's no way I'm going back in there. No way I'm going back in there. He's like, why? He said, because the nurse said, as I'm getting ready to have my surgery, don't worry. It's just an apodectomy. It's not that big of a deal. Don't be afraid. And the office, and the, office the administrator said, well, I'm sorry to disagree with you here, but doesn't a statement like that comfort you? And he said, oh, yeah. If she said it to me, but she was saying it to the doctor. I'm telling you right now, people, you can doubt. A lot of people don't keep their word. You can doubt people. You can question people. But I'm telling you, don't doubt Christ. Don't doubt him. Maybe today you are here and you have some of these same questions, some doubts. God, are you really in the middle of all this? Are you really in the middle of all this? I had a guy come up to, to me in the gym on Wednesday. He said, uh, he said oh, you're a pastor, right? I said, I am. A bunch of, the, bunch of the guys down there, they call me Rev. <laughs> hey, Rev, hitting it hard today. This guy comes up and he's, hey, you're a pastor, right? I said, I am. He said, Rev, I got a question for you. He said, everything going on in our country right now, Are you having any doubts? Do you have any doubts in your faith? And I looked at him and I said, well, I said, I doubt human beings. I said, I doubt people. But I don't doubt Christ is still in charge right now. The Almighty is still running things right now. Don't doubt him. Don't doubt him. It's so easy to start to sink with everything going on in our world around us, it's so easy to start to go underwater. Don't doubt him. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. That word says always. doesn't say sometimes. doesn't say once in a while. doesn't say maybe there to help us in times of trouble. What's it say? Always. Always, always. He's always there in times of trouble. I don't care if you're in the middle of a storm right now. He's always with you in times of trouble. I don't care about the storm that might hit you down the road. He's always going to be with you in times of trouble. Always going to be with you in times of trouble. Pastor Matt, does God get mad at me when I doubt what he's doing sometimes? Nope. He understands you. He understands how we think. He understands how we think. But get that doubt out of your mind as quickly as possible and realize and understand he's still in charge. He is always with you in times of trouble. The biggest thing I get out of this story, and I love this, everybody views Peter as a guy who didn't have the faith. Ah, he got out of the boat and he focused on the storm and the wind and the waves and all of a sudden he starts to think, oh, Peter, oh, Peter, you're going to mess up again. You know what I say? At least he got his butt out of the boat. At least he got out of the boat. There's too many Christians in this world. We're in the boat and we're not getting out of the boat. I'm here to tell you right now, you get out of the boat, some fear might hit you, some distractions might hit you, and some doubt might hit you. But get your butt out of the boat. You're not a threat to Satan just, saying, just staying in the boat, letting stuff going, go on around you. You're not a threat. He's not worried about them. But Peter got out of the boat. When you get out of the boat, you're going to go through some things. You're going to deal, deal with fear and distractions and doubt because all of a sudden, you're a threat. You're a threat. But man, I'd give anything to be in that situation. And I hope I'd get out of the boat. In this church, I hope that we got people that want to get out of the boat. 
might get tough. You might have to leave your comfort zone. It would be like Peter and at least get out of the boat. You start to sink, he'll catch you. He'll pull you back up. And good news, you got a whole bunch of people in this church. If you get out of the boat and you feel like you're in the middle of the storm and things are starting to happen, there's a bunch of people in this church, guess what? We'll reach down and help you up too. That's a promise. That's why I started out today talking about this church being a family. This church is a family. People come here and they visit and they tell me, it doesn't feel like church, it feels like a family. Get out of the boat. And if you struggle, we will be here for you. But more importantly, Christ will be here for you. Be a Peter and get out of the boat. Focus on Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to... I want to ask you to forgive me, Lord, of those times in my life as a pastor where I have fear, when I'm distracted, and I have doubt. I struggle sometimes with what's going on. I struggle sometimes with distractions. My goodness, we all struggle with that. But I want to thank you, Lord, for being near us at all times. You're with us at all times. You died on the cross for our sins so that we could be with you at all times. If you're sitting here today and you have fear in your life, if there's distractions pulling you away from Christ and you have doubt that he's still in charge and he's still controlling things, I'm here to tell you right now, Just keep your focus on Christ. Keep your focus on Christ. And if you sit here today and you say, you know, Pastor Matt, I've never focused on Christ. I've focused on every other thing in the world, and Christ has been at the bottom of the list. Well, it's probably because you've never given your heart to Christ. And I'm going to give you that opportunity right now where you sit to give your heart to Jesus Christ. It's simple, it's not complicated, it's simple. You just got to admit you're a sinner, you're in need of a savior, and ask him to be in charge of your life and forgive your sins. You can do that right now where you sit. No one else can hear you, but God can. And I want you to pray this prayer, and I want you to mean it. Say this. Say, Dear Lord, today I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive my sins, save my soul, and take me to heaven when I die. Make me the type of person you want me to be. If you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, it wasn't just words, but you meant it. You really gave your heart to Christ today with nobody looking around. I want you to put your hand up and let God know you prayed that prayer today. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. You put it down. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for a day in your house, Lord. We want to thank you for always being with us in the middle of the storm. It's sometimes hard to focus on you, Lord, but we know that we need to. We're going to always keep our eyes on you. Give us safety this week as we're traveling on the roads and going to work and doing everything we're doing during the week. Lord, keep us safe. Watch over us. Give us opportunities to be a Peter this week and step out of the boat. We're going to leave our comfort zone. We ask this in your heavenly holy name we pray. Amen. Remember our motto here at the church, bringing the unchanging truth of Jesus to an ever-changing world.